Welcome to Earth Chapters, hosted by Pollinator Friendly Alliance. Pollinator Friendly Alliance is a grassroots nonprofit powered by the enthusiasm of our partners and volunteers to protect the natural world, pollinators, and their habitats. Find us at pollinatorfriendly.org. Remember, everything in the natural world is connected. An ecosystem is a community of living things that work together and rely upon the other. Let's be good stewards of the ecosystem. Today's chapter is Soil Health, Nature's Medicine with Dr. Anne Marie Journey and Sheet Composting Soil Preparation with Bob Dom from Organic Bobs. So let's get started and 11 million other arthropods, which includes insects and everything else with a lot of legs. So how do we have a healthy soil to have all those things living in it? Well, there are four practices that the uh, NRCS recommends and I'm gonna run through them quickly and kind of give you an idea of why we recommend each one. The first is to minimize disturbance. So the, um, picture of my colleague there, he's actually in that same uh, cornfield that I started with. Um, he's holding a root and the root is showing you that 300 PSI pounds per square inch, which is how much roots can exert radially. Uh, axially, they can only do about 70 pounds per square inch. Uh, but that's not always enough to get through compacted soil. So if you look carefully at that root, that plant twisted itself three ways trying to grow. So in his hand, there's a, a soiled area of the root. That was actually in the soil and it gets thin. And the, the radish kept growing, but it couldn't grow further down. So it, it pushed itself up out of the soil and then without the support of the soil, it toppled over. And then because the leaves were all disarranged, then you got a second twisting, uh, which was the positive phototropism trying to reorient the leaves toward the sun. And then you get the third twisting. If you look just above his hand, there are these little roots coming out from the side. That's the radish trying to find new places to continue downward growth around. So it is prospecting for soil cracks or earthworm tunnels or anything else where it can send roots farther down. So that's how adaptive that plant was trying to be. And that was because of an old plow pan at about 10 inches. So if you look at this, the tillage disturbance profiles below there, and, and I've represented this as a standard corn row, 30 inches wide, um, and then showed how much of that row would be disturbed by each type of tillage. So with a moldboard plow, which is typically about 10 inches deep, you're literally turning over virtually all of the soil profile uh, as you go down the road. The same thing applies, by the way, if you're rototilling, but if you're rototilling, you're effectively putting your soil in the blender on puree, or maybe even frappe, because you're just whipping it uh, to death. With a subsoil shank, you get a much narrower uh, disruption of the soil, but where it is disturbed, it's disturbed deeper. That's um, a uh, 14 inches deep event. And then if you're no-tilling, and this also applies in yards and gardens, then you're only going down about a half an inch and you might be going um, about an inch wide. So you're leaving all of those soil collect connections together. And one of the ones that you are leaving that's very important is the connection of the pores in the soil. So when a soil scientist goes out and they measure bulk density or they measure uh, penetrometer resistance, or even uh, when we're looking at something like infiltration rates for water, what we're effectively looking at is the pore structure of the soil. And is it intact. If it's intact when it rains and water goes down into the soil, then it pulls behind it fresh air and the soil literally takes breath. And as far and as wide as that pore system extends, then that fresh air can move and you get that oxygen exchange as in your lungs when you breathe in and out. Now the two cores that you see, these are CT scans of a subsoil actually. Uh, they were taken about 10 inches below the surface. The one on the left with all those lovely vertical pores, and a lot of them were probably earthworms, um, that was um, 
field, uh, soil that was under a fence row. This is from a sugar beet field. It's actually, I believe, in Denmark. Um, and it had not been disturbed. And the one on the right, where you see not very much blue and what there is is kind of mashed together and awful looking, also taken from about 10 inches deep. And the difference is that um, it had been driven over once by a beet harvester. And that had happened 14 years before the core was dug. So in 14 years, um, these plants trying to push their way through and earthworms trying to get in there had had very little um, effect in terms of maintain or repairing the porosity that would allow air and nutrients and water to move through that soil. Kind of creates a dead zone. The second one is to increase plant diversity. Uh, if you look at the old drawing, uh, 1919, uh, that's probably somebody sitting out in a field with a spoon, which is how you do this, um, documenting the root systems of prairie plants. On the left-hand side of that uh, diagram, there is a depth gauge. So that's rooting depth in feet, and it goes feet below the soil surface. And he was looking at native prairie plants. So two things to look at there. Uh, one is just the absolute depth and, and the richness of some of these root systems. Uh, and then is uh, to look at their different forms. Uh, each plant, uh, as it is in the soil, is constructing for itself a home. Uh, and so a taproot system is going to have a different effect on the soil around it than a fibrous root system. Uh, tap roots create that one nice big hole that goes down the middle and then they branch. Fibrous root systems like the grasses tend to create a lot of very fine roots. All of them are producing these root exudates that go out in the soil and help the soil to be bound together, the sand, silt, and clay of the soil particles. But you get a different kind of texture with each one of these. You also get different root exudates uh, deposited at different levels in the soil, and these root exudates feed different parts of the soil biology. So the more different exudates are out there, uh, the better it is in terms of the diversity of things living in the soil, because some of these are very tight associations. A couple of years ago, when um, Gustavus Adolphus hosted their Nobel conference, uh, one of the most fascinating talks to me was by a microbiologist, and he pointed out that big blue stem, which is a dominant prairie grass, has a very, very tight and heretofore un unappreciated association with a bacteria called Verruco microbium. If you try to grow big blue stem without this microbe, without this bacterium, the big blue stem is less drought tolerant and it has a harder time with cold. And if you think about the Great Plains, they get cold and they tend to be droughty. So here is a partnership between a plant and its soil microbe um, that is really key to the plant developing the kind of dominance across the Great Plains that it, that it enjoyed. Likewise, you cannot really culture that bacterium without the plant. So here's an example of that partnership. And of course, I've also showed uh, pollinators as being part of the partnership. Uh, there are a number of plants out there that have a pollinator. And if they don't have that pollinator, then they don't produce seed very well. Uh, and for anybody listening of um, <clears throat> the, as one might say, female persuasion, um, one of the most tight associations out there between a plant and its pollinator is a chocolate, which is really worrisome to me uh, because I need chocolate. It's a food group all by itself. And the chocolate plant is pollinated most effectively by a midge, which is small enough to get into the chocolate flower. Um, Theobroma cacao has one of the most complicated and small flowers there is out there. Now you can get a certain amount of wind pollination, but you'll get about 80% of your pods aborting without that midge. The midge, coming into our next thing, is dependent on the structure of soil for its livelihood because it's an aquatic insect, but it breeds in the wet leaf litter at the base of a um, typical rainforest environment to which um, 
the oak Bromo cacao is native in that very moist leaf litter. Without it, no midges, no midges, no chocolate. This is a problem. Third soil health practice, keep the soil covered. Um, this is a basic one. You'll see it here in a little bit because I've got a demonstration at the end of soil that was not covered. Uh, there are two reasons to keep it covered. One is, is temperature. When uh, soil isn't shaded, I'm sure we've all had the experience of stepping on bare soil with a bare foot in say August and regretting it. Uh, it heats up very quickly. And the other thing that's going on is as the soil is heating, the plants are desperately starting to use water out of the soil to keep themselves cool. So this is a beautiful day. I'm looking out my sunroom window. My maple tree is starting to expand its leaves pretty aggressively. Uh, and because it's only, say, 55, 60 degrees today, the maple tree could actually use a few more degrees before um, photosynthesis is going to be going at, chief, at its uh, best efficiency, rather. Uh, that's between 70, uh, 77 and 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, once you get above 95 degrees Fahrenheit, the plants start to try and air condition themselves to protect the enzymes that drive photosynthesis. And they do that by taking up soil water and then take it, throwing it out through the leaves. That's evapotranspiration. When the transpired water goes out through the leaf surface, it evaporates. The evaporative cooling cools the leaf and it also cools the air around it, which is why when you step under a tree on a hot day, you feel even more cool than you expect to because it's literally doing the same thing that we do with tall buildings. Take water up and throw it out the top and let the evaporation cool it. Now, as that's occurring, soil can warm up even faster because a dry soil does not have the heat sink capacity that a wet soil does. And at a certain point, you're going to get the possibility of uh, having a bare soil basically cook itself. It's sort of, um, you might think of it like putting it in the autoclave. Now, this far north, that isn't going to happen too often. But I offer you um, this graph on the right, <clears throat> excuse me, just to see how suddenly it can happen. Um, that's some temperature loggers that I had in a research cornfield in Rosemount, Minnesota in uh, 2005, and they were buried at two inches. And I, I was only worried about the period from about May through June because I was um, modeling corn rootworm larval development and I needed to keep track of, of temperature because insects are temperature driven. The red dots are from a field that was bare. Uh, Pre-emergence herbicide worked really well. I had clean corn. Um, and then the other field was full of, of other grasses. There really wasn't very much bare soil. And if you look at those two days in middle June, two or three days, the temperature in that bare soil at two degrees started to spike up. Now it's still only getting into the upper 80s, but for reference, when we went back there in August to dig up the corn plants and see if our treatments had protected them, <clears throat> excuse me, against corn rootworm. I really apologize for that sound, folks. My allergies are bad today. Um, we had to wet down the alleys to walk on them in work boots. They were that hot. So that's the first reason that you want to keep your soil covered. The second reason is rain. And I'll be able to show you um, the effect of this kind of splash damage here shortly. When a raindrop hits soil, it can hit it at 20 miles an hour and it can throw particles. If you look in the splash, you'll see little dark bits. Uh, that's the sand, silt, and clay of soil being blasted apart um, by this rain bomb. And they may travel five feet in every direction. They can travel two feet vertically. So if you uh, want to see this in practice, just look at the uh, side of any light colored building that has uh, bare earth right next to it. You'll see dirt halfway up the wall. Uh, and it is dirt at that point, not soil. Now, if you have the armor on the soil surface, your soil can take a tremendous beating. So the picture of this beautiful grassy field, um, that is Gabe Brown's, I think it's one of his corn fields, in uh, 2008, in uh, 2010 rather, in uh, North Dakota. And he'd had 13 inches of rain in 24 hours on that field. And what's conspicuously missing 
is puddles, ponds, flooding. His soil took in 13 inches of rain within 24 hours. Now, the only time I've ever seen 13 inches of rain in 24 hours was when then tropical storm Agnes came to visit my hometown of Washington, DC in 1972. And she dropped 13 inches of rain in about 24 hours and the P Potomac River flooded so badly that it took out the CNO Canal. Uh, downtown was kind of off limits for a few days and my dad was lowering me into window wells so I could help him bail. There was literally nowhere for that water to go. So it ran off because it was an urban setting. We didn't have good soil health. I didn't understand that as a 12 year old. I do now. But here's Gabe's soil that could take that all in and it does it every single year when there's excess moisture. So a couple of years ago when they had um, a tremendous drought in that part of North Dakota, Gabe's neighbors were all looking at him because he was still growing corn. And they were not because his soil had been able to take all that water in and store it. Now, the other half of this is if you have bare soil, um, you get the runoff events. The, the picture with all the erosion is actually a cornfield in Iowa on a four inch rainstorm, which is a pretty common summer rainstorm. Now, if you look at our timeline of Minnesota's historic mega events, and that, that's usually referring to rain that's approaching 10 inches in one storm, um, those are getting more common, um, but even the regular rainstorms are, are getting rainier as it were. And we have uh, the picture down in the right is what happens after uh, you get that kind of, of water and, and the blasting apart of the soil surface when it's bare, you get a crust. And the crust is the clays first and then the silts and the, the sand underneath them. And that impedes further infiltration of water, but it's also almost impossible for inverts to get through. So it just seals the soil and, and kind of says, no go, nobody comes here, nobody, we can't breathe, we're just gonna be hermetic. The last one is to maintain living roots. And this is living roots as long as you can in the season. So when we think about our gardens, we think about agricultural fields, we tend to think in terms of growing season. And that's significantly short-sighted because growing season to our native environments started about a month ago and it really isn't gonna end until sometime in November, probably. Uh, and in that interim between when we think of growing season and when everything else thinks there's growing season, uh, if you don't have living roots in the system to pump in those sugars and proteins and lipids and everything else, then things are basically starving. So I have early spring, is anything growing yet? Well, that's um, a lot of insects, that's earthworms, that's even some uh, seeds that require a little assistance to germinate. If nothing is going yet, then everything is basically forced to work with whatever labile carbon is left in the, in the soil from the previous season. Likewise, uh, if there's a fall, have we ended the growing season in August and then basically just left everything in the soil to starve for six months until, not six months, pardon me, uh, for six weeks or you know two or three months until things finally cool down enough. And then one thing I'd like to point out in the, uh, the center picture, if you look closely and I hope you can see it, uh, there are two different colors of soil in between my colleague's thumb. And there's a little tiny earthworm channel there and that's evidence of bioturbation. Um, the earthworm had uh, done some uh, casting behind itself, uh, basically as an earthworm is moving through soil, soil it glows in one end and it comes out the other. Uh, and so since that's a continuous process, earthworms can actually mix soil horizons. Now I'd like to get to the more buggy part of this talk since you've now had the blitz of uh, what soil health means and the practices. This is a tale of three fields. So a couple summers ago, <clears throat> the NRCS and the DNR did a dynamic soil properties sampling on some DNR land in Fergus Falls. Uh, it's beautiful property. It's been divided into effectively three parts. Uh, as of that year, 
um, the DNR had an agreement in place with anybody who was uh, renting land that they had to use no-till practices. Uh, and this um, opportunity for us was to compare three different systems. So the big picture is this, the most important to me of the three. Um, this was land that had been prairie up until 1887. In 1887, the prairie was broken. And that beautiful uh, meadow had been farmed conventionally from 1887 to 1987. In 1987, it was converted to perennial grasses and a mixture of, of prairie type plants. Um, then another field, uh, you can see some corn uh, lying down on the ground. Two of my colleagues are working with that corn. That corn field was still uh, in conventional farming, which included moldboard plowing until fairly recently, um, up until the year before we actually sampled it. So it, it was literally the first no-till spring that that soil had had. And then you see two of my colleagues uh, working in some clover. The third field had been converted about three years previously uh, over to pasture. And it had a mix of plants in it. The predominant one was red clover. So one of the things we were doing while we were sampling was digging up a cubic foot of soil in each one of these and looking for earthworms in it. And it just so happened that it was a good thing there was an entomologist in the group because all of a sudden people were saying, Anne, what is this? Anne, what is this? Anne, what is this? Because they kept finding things they weren't using, used to finding in that prairie conversion. And I took some pictures of a few of them. This is a complete underrepresentation of what was there. The first thing that really got my attention was this common wood nymph, the butterfly, and it's actually photographed on an ATV tire. They were everywhere. I mean, everywhere. And I'm used to being in cornfields and seeing some butterflies along the edges, but I hadn't seen this many butterflies anywhere near a cornfield ever. And so I started that really kind of set off alarm bells and it was like, oh, this could be good. So we were finding in that field, um, the rove beetle larvae, that's what's on the shelter belt, that's predator. We also had um, bees, little ground bees, minor bees that were nesting in the soil. We had cutworms. You know, we basically had everything. So we've got a, I suspect that is a seed predator weevil. I didn't get to identify it. It walked off my hand. Uh, we had some scarabs. Those are the white grubs. And then we also had wireworms. We were finding insects that were living in the soil and on the soil and above the soil. The diversity in there was insane. I, I wrote like three pages of notes just of the stuff that I could see while I was doing other things. And it was every group that you would expect to have in Minnesota in the summer in that field. So nine of 10 insects agree that soil is the place to be if it's healthy soil because nine of 10 insects are thought to spend at least part of their life cycle in soil. In this part of the world, it's a great place to lay an egg and have it over winter, nice constant temperature, sheltered. Yeah, you're gonna have some predators under there, they're gonna get some of them, but your chances are pretty good of getting your eggs through if that's your overwintering strategy. Some of these other insects like the wood nymph um, shelter over the winter in the, the organic layer, the O horizon, right on the top of the soil. So it's really important that that's not disturbed and turned under. We think there might be 10 quintillion insects alive at any one time. That's probably less than there were 40 or 50 years ago. But it gives you an idea of how dependent we are as a species on the, if there are that many of them, then obviously they have jobs to do and they are doing them in the ecosystem. Now, this is what happens when you don't have healthy soil. This is that cornfield that was right next to the beautiful field that had me so entranced with all the insects in it. The first thing I noticed about the cornfield was that the butterflies didn't go in it at all. They stopped. There, there, there was like a force field. They would not fly over that cornfield. So the only thing flying in that cornfield were uh, mosquitoes, which liked me a lot, and because I was in between the rows, 
Uh, and then above the cornfield, as you'd expect with the lake right there and mosquitoes in abundance, uh, there were dragonflies maintaining their stations so that they could hunt those mosquitoes. I didn't even see that many flies and there were uh, cattle in the pasture. So I'm kind of wondering why the flies didn't like the cornfield. There was a field road that went through it and right on the boundary of the field road there were a few little white clovers kind of struggling and some ragweed and occasionally when I was working along there I'd see a honeybee come and, and visit them. But otherwise it was it was just dead for insects in that conventionally tilled cornfield. And I took this picture because I was, uh, part of my responsibility was to document soil cover. So if you look at that soil, you can see cracks and you can see large residue um, that because it wasn't uh, fall tilled the year before and it was uh, not spring tilled that year, you've got more than one year of residue and the thing that's really kind of shocking is that if you look under the number 25 you might see some curly brown leaves those curly brown leaves are last year's soybean leaves soybean has a very high carbon nitrogen i mean a low carbon nitrogen uh, ratio there's a lot of nitrogen in it it is rapidly degraded as a form of residue but those are intact and the reason they're intact is that there are no shredders. Remember I said earlier that you'd have tens of millions of mites per acre. I don't think there was a mite in that entire field, or if there was, there weren't very many, because this debris, this residue from the previous years hasn't been attacked. So here is my kind of end slide, soil has an easy button, which is the soil food web. It only works when it's connected. And when it does, we have this tremendous opportunity to let the things that live in soil do all the good things they do in soil. But when we intervene, we interfere in those processes. Lori, I see you up in the corner. Are you telling me it's time for my little demo? <laughs> It's time to uh, round it up, yeah. Okay, yeah. so here's my little demo. Um, Lori, can you fix it so they can see my, me? Because we don't probably don't need that slide as much. Okay, I'm going to, okay, starting my video. There we go. Okay, earlier I talked about a soil crust. If you can see this, this is soil in my backyard. I dug this up a couple days ago. You can see there's a lighter part and a darker part. The lighter part indicates the crust. This soil has been bare. It looks kind of like a rock. This soil came from my tomato bed, which I leave alone and I keep covered and I'm a very lazy tomato grower. I tried to dig up a clod, but because it's healthy soil and it wants to fall apart into these lovely little things called aggregates, these nuggets of joy, uh, it did that when I picked it up the other day. Now a quick test that anybody can do if they have a little chicken wire and a vase is what we call a slake test. I don't know how this is gonna work, but here is my unhealthy, rather compacted, crusted soil. I'm gonna put it in water. And if you notice, as the water goes into the soil, wow, this is working insanely well, that's scary. Um, that big thing of soil is just exploding. The water is entering what pores there are and it is literally bombing itself to bits. This is even without the uh, effort of rain hitting it from the top. Wow, I've got to remember how good my backyard soil is for this demo. Okay, so that will be um, gone in a few seconds. Now I'll try my other soil. A healthy soil has all kinds of glues holding it together. Now some of that was loose. But if you look at it, you can see that the healthy soil, once the loose stuff fell apart, oh, and by the way, the loose stuff is holding together because it has the glues from the microbes doing this. This could probably sit in water for two or three days 
and still look the way it does now because it is a healthy soil full of microbes that have glued it together so the sand, silt, and clay remain in aggregates. That is super fun, and thank you so much for sharing that little demonstration. That's our first little demonstration. That's um, pretty cool. Often suggested to folks that they should shake the hand of their farmer, but I think I need to tell people to shake the hand of their soil microbes now. Very much so. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. We're going to uh, hear more from Ann at the end. So everybody send your questions in the chat. And uh, we're going to welcome Bob Dom up now. Bob, can you share your screen? Can you see that? I can. All right. Take it away, Bob. Okay, well, welcome everybody. It's good to be here and it's, um, it's kind of fun to follow in Anne Marie's footsteps. I've attended workshops that she's presented at and I'm, I'm a bit of a groupie, so it's, it's a real honor. Um, and to tell you a little about myself, I grew up on a farm in Iowa. I'm that handsome young man in the striped suit on my dad's lap. Uh, my mom was a school teacher and she taught soil conservation also. And my dad and most of the adult men I knew were farmers. And I watched my dad and my grandfather um, die of cancer as did many of the men in my community. Um, and then years later, my brother Pat, the one on the far right, uh, the only one to go into farming, he died of cancer here about a year and a half ago. So it's, um, agriculture is just not a healthy endeavor when done with its conventional chemicals and without the uh, mind of, you know, soil health in mind. And here are some results. And the, this slide here will kind of demonstrates what we're trying to do uh, on a microbial, soil microbe level. Uh, the soil many times is, is had so much disturbance that it's like bare rock or it's been very, very damaged. And, and Mother Nature does not like what we've done with the soil. Uh, she wants to return it to an oak savanna or something similar. And so in this slide, the amount of bacterial biomass in the soil is relatively constant, although it changes in makeup as you go from left to right. What changes is the fungi and the amount of fungi in the soil. And so on the left side at Bear Rock, you have very little. On the right side in the Climax communities, it, you have massive amounts of fungi because all these trees are connected and talking to each other and, uh, and with other plants as well. And where those two pretty much intersect, the bacteria and fungi is the line between weeds and grasses more or less. And so on the grass side of the line, you have more fungal content in the soil. And on the weed side, you have more bacterial. Um, and that's, that's interesting because then you can, if you can manipulate that, you will achieve uh, a healthy lawn and a healthy soil that weeds aren't really interested in annual and biennial weeds. And this, um, I get really geeked out. You saw this slide in um, Anne-Marie's um, presentation also, and it's a root-feeding nematode, and it's tangled up in a, a fungal hyphae, and, um, and there's a plant root in the background. So it's just, it's a, 
an example of the complexity of relationships that are going on in the soil. And I, I, I love this one. So I just had to throw it in there. Uh, in the soil food web, you know, you can go into it like a lawn. And if you see a lot of uh, one kind of weed or another, it will indicate soil problems. And so like when I see, you know, creeping Charlie, it's a sign of a pH imbalance on either side of the scale. And it usually indicates a calcium deficiency, uh, which can be because there aren't, there are no microbes there or not the ones that will break down the, um, the rock material, the sand and silt and clay in the, in the soil to release the calcium or it's just, you know, just an unhealthy soil. And what we'll be talking about, sheet composting, it, it leapfrogs that ecological succession from a damaged soil, past the weeds, past the grasses, all the way up into a highly fungal soil. So sheet composting, it's also been called lasagna gardening or sheet mulching or smothering, but it, in essence, what happens is the cardboard will smother the vegetation and then the microbes in the compost reproduce and they start breaking everything down, the shredders and uh, the the aggregators, stuff like that. So they're building a healthy soil as you go. Now the, the one shortcoming of this is plants with deep tap roots or rhizomes or tubers can survive, but they pull out easily. Um, so like the day lilies in the background in this picture, you can sheet compost them, but those suckers are, they are tough and they, they'll survive this. Um, and then, but the, like if a dandelion were there, you'd kill more than half, but not all of them. But the ones that survive pull out very easily because the microbes have just gone to town on that soil and loosened it. So here's what we want to do. You want to water it thoroughly the, the day before, give it an, an inch, um, uh, that's equal to about two hours of irrigation time. You want to soak that water so these microbes that you're trying to grow, they, they have the water that they need in order to, you know, set up shop. And then you want to mow or cut it down, um, leave the vegetation there, just chop and drop. And the, if you're doing woody material, you can actually uh, chip it and scatter it out in place. And I've done this with buckthorn and then uh, sheet composted or even just treated with uh, an aerobic compost tea, which is all the living organisms from a healthy soil. And it, it actually um, made the soil healthy enough so that it didn't favor buckthorn anymore uh, because buckthorn has a very uh, strong influence on the soil biology. And so it, it kind of remedies that. And then when you go to plant natives in there, the the natives take off and do really well and the buckthorn uh, seedlings are somewhat suppressed. And so we do this, we start out by mixing up um, molasses and water and you sprinkle or spray it with a pump up garden sprayer over the area that you wanna, you wanna convert and Unsulfured is a must. Sulfur is a preservative and it works by killing uh, or preventing microbe from producing, reproducing. So you, you definitely need unsulfured molasses. And if you can get organic, 
even better. And then we'll be adding compost. And I mean, you can do as, as little as a 16th of an inch, um, you know, like 150 pounds per thousand square feet. And, or you can do, you can do more, um, but it's good to do a little bit. And many of the compost from big box stores, they've actually been pasteurized and they, they aren't, um, they aren't any good. They don't have any biology in them. And, and what the role of the compost is, it's, it's an inoculant. Think of it as a sourdough starter. So you'll be spreading this out and then uh, you add the molasses and the cardboard and, and just give it some time and it, it, they will reproduce like crazy. And then the cardboard, uh, two layers of clean corrugated cardboard. Uh, you, you can do three layers. I've had people who have done three layers over Creeping Charlie. Uh, Creeping Charlie responds very well to this, meaning that it, it dies and it doesn't come back. Um, and I, I can just hear people cheering out there <laughs> as I speak about this, because Creeping Charlie promotes a very strong uh, emotional reaction. But you want to remove the labels, uh, staples, and and if you don't get them all, or if you don't get all the tape, uh, you'll find it a year later. The cardboard will be gone, and and the labels and tape will still be there. And you, you want to soak this to hold it in place. So, and then from the cardboard, there's a couple directions you can go. You can put soil on top and, you know, like an inch or two, and then seed into that. Um, this is a great way of, of converting some lawn into a veggie garden very quickly. Now uh, you do this and then in that two inches of soil on top, you can plant greens or stuff that's shallow rooted and you get two or three crops or cuttings off of that. And by that time, then the cardboard and the, the lawn are uh, dead and breaking down. So then you can go back and, and plant in the tomatoes or peppers or uh, seed in carrots or, you know, do the root vegetables or the, the larger rooted plants. And it, it, it works really well. Um, you know, so you can do the soil on top or you can do mulch on, on top of the cardboard and just let it go for maybe a month and plant into it with whatever plants you want. And so another method you can do is if you wanted to do this in the fall, uh, you could add the soil and compost blend a couple inches thick on top of that cardboard and then, <coughs> excuse me, seed in the cover crops at winter kill like Crimson clover, oats, rye, annual ryegrass, or even daikon radishes, and they will they will protect that soil over the winter, and they'll add nutrients and organic matter, and those daikon radishes will uh, go down and they'll break up the soil, and then you just let all that decompose in place, and seed or plant into it in the next next spring. Um, or you can just use mulch instead of soil and plant your starter plants. And this is a great way to establish uh, native plants because what's overlooked many times in ecological restoration, people like to go in and, you know, rip out the invasives and plant the, um, the native plant communities. and but what what is missing many times and is key to the success is the native microbial communities uh, that evolved with these organisms and and every plant will kind of pick its team it likes to grow with like the big blue stem that Anne Marie mentioned um, 
has a, a bacteria it partners with and and many plants are like that they have you know some really good solid companions that it they if they have those there they will they will thrive and and this is one of the best ways of achieving diversity in your soil so and this is just a step by step um, you can snap a photo of this or um, copy it real quickly. And the, again, it's, you know, the, the compost piece is important. Uh, the compost that most people have in their backyard is, does not have the good diversity that you want. Um, you, you really need to spend some money on a good compost, but again, you don't need very much. So a, a sixteenth of an inch of, of quality compost will surpass even a foot of bad compost because the bad stuff just does not have what you need. So here's a project we did with um, Canadian thistle. And it was standing tall, like three to four feet tall. And um, we just went in and we chop it and drop it, left it lay. And we did some newspaper and uh, or cardboard and then just some grass clippings on top. And this is what it looked like 60 days later. Now you can see there's some white roots there. Those are actually quack grass roots, which um, hadn't quite smothered, but there's a bit of a white cast on this uh, newspaper. And that white, um, some of it is bacteria, but some of it is the fungi that we are talking about, the white mycelium of the fungi, and that's growing. Um, and that's great. That's exciting to see that there. And, and you can see some threads of it too in the plant residue. So, and this is the thistle residue after 60 days. I mean, it's just been chewed up almost into nothing. And you can also see the structure starting to form with the earthworm holes there. <laughs> Excuse me. So it was, this was really great. And you can see the, the fungal strands on the cardboard here on the left side, you see those white strands, that's the fungi growing. So again, we're, we're getting that mature soil food web going uh, with very little effort. You know, this would take years um, or, you know, repeated seasons to get this kind of growth. And then we went in and we followed it up with uh, planted some natives and they took off and they did very well. And uh, my, myself and my friend, uh, Natalie Shanstrom from past ecological design are developing an all native bee lawn um, that can be seeded. And this is our preferred method for doing it um, because they usually, the natives like to be dormant seeded. So if you do this process, started in August and then in late October, you can go in and seed the native seeds into this and then put an erosion blanket over it. Uh, the, the biology will continue to grow and, and do wonderful things over the winter, although much, much more slowly. Thank you for joining us for today's Earth Chapter. Thanks to Pollinator Friendly Alliance, our host, and Ramsey County Soil and Water, our co-host. If you have questions or inquiries, please contact pollinatorfriendly.org.